You see, once loyalty begins, it does not have an end. Otherwise, it would not be loyalty. But loyal turns senseless very quickly when the order is suicide. Would you like me to translate that? Or was it for me? Welcome to Shogun, the official podcast. My name is Emily Yoshida, and I was a writer on the show. And each week, after every episode, we dive deeper into the different elements that went into making Shogun, with co-creators Justin Marks and Rachel Kondo, along with the cast and crew that helped bring this story to life. Today, we'll be talking about Episode 8, The Abyss of Life. And as always, this is a quick heads up that there will be spoilers for this and all previous episodes of the show. And I'd also like to give a quick content warning that this episode will include discussions about suicide. On today's podcast, I'll hear about the emotional undertones of the tea ceremony from director Emmanuel Osei Kafour, the fates of the real-life shipwreck sailors from historian Frederick Krenz, and creating the foundations of the city that will become Tokyo with production designer Helen Jarvis. But first, showrunner Justin Marks gives us some insight into our characters' choices in this episode and the introduction of Toronaga's unfinished city, Edo. We have in our show a variety of settings, and for us as writers, it was really important that every setting felt unique. You know, Osaka, for example, as the main city up until this point, is always depicted by means of this idea of imprisonment. Even the sound design of Osaka Castle, that we robbed the gardens of the thing that matter most in Osaka, which is the birds that you would always Mm. recognize. And I said, if you hear birds too many times, you're going to think that this is a nice place. Uh, And we wanted to (laughs) feel like we were depicting it with some sense of paranoia. But in Edo, we have this other thing, and we needed it to represent something very different from Osaka. And so Edo really is the future. That's what we wanted more than anything. From the moment it's introduced, it's introduced from Toronaga's point of view, looking over a bridge into its unconstructed future. And, you know, you see it as Toronaga sees it, which is it's everything of where his fate is pulling him. And yet we're seeing it at a moment where, to quote Gin in episode seven, Toronaga doesn't have a future. It may be out of reach for him. So this representation of an unbuilt future, I think, is really in a very expressionistic kind of way. It's the physical manifestation of where Toronaga is in the story, which is look at my unbuilt road ahead. Another huge moment that has been built up for a very long time, and we finally get to see this episode, is Blackthorn's reunion with his crew, which is, of course, not exactly how he imagined it to go. And this is another big character moment because it kind of changes, I think, Blackthorn's sense of the world and sense of like what he's going to do, like who he is. Yeah, it's such an interesting, this sequence is such an interesting one in the book. And the evolution of this sequence in our show was, you know, where in a lot of ways we as a writer's room, and then producing the show, found our modernity, right? So much of this is based around this idea of a, if you're going by the stranger in a strange land story, and all of the tropes that that is bound to, you know, this is an essential scene in that story shape, right? Because it's the moment when the character who has seemingly begun to integrate himself into a new society finds that he really is no longer part of the world that he came from. We didn't quite buy that as writers in a modern day. And, you know, I think what we really felt was that one can never truly integrate themselves into something that they weren't born into, that they don't belong to, that that's a bit of a fantasy, that one can wear the costume and one can speak a language, but that doesn't really speak to the idea of belonging. I think belonging is something that, you know, we're all trying to understand for ourselves and for others among us. And that's one of the things that you know, where we are today and why Shogun is such an important story for today is something that I think, you know, we wanted to explore it on a deeper level. And it's actually, I have to credit, the scene did evolve past the writer's room. It was a conversation with Cosmo Jarvis, our lead actor. It was Cosmo who said, I want to confront it and I want to be confronted by it. And I want to be confronted by who I am 
for all of my ugliness to be seen by someone and to reveal it that way, that he was willing to beg, cheat, and steal in the way that he's been doing with the Japanese, but he was also willing to do it with his own men because, frankly, Blackthorn has these colonial impulses that we really wanted to interrogate and to confront him with at this moment when he doesn't know what else to do and he thinks he's going to his men to get everything that he's wanted. I've made my way in Japan and I can use those connections. Maybe things didn't go the way they were supposed to go with Toronaga, but that's okay. Now I've got my ship and my men back. And even his men have finally come to terms with who he is. And so he has no roads back and he has to go to his secret shadow on every level. And that's Yabushige, <laughs> a man who, like Blackthorn, tells lies out of every orifice uh, of his body <laughs> and has only this kind of clinging to survival in his arsenal. You know, Yabushige and Blackthorn from the very first episode when they stared at each other on that cliff, really are spiritually entwined. They are the same man yeah. in a lot of ways yeah. from two different sides of that culture. And so we love this buddy comedy that's kind of burgeoning between them or tragedy, depending on which way you look at it. <laughs> but, you know, we so we use that scene with his own men as a way of kind of forcing him into the arms of Yabushige, you know, which is something we really, I think, embellished and took beyond where it was in the book. So also in this episode, we have the seppuku of Hiromatsu. And in this scene in front of all of Toronaga's guys, all of his vassals, how much knowledge does Hiromatsu really have as to like what this big plan is for Toronaga or what he's truly planning here? Or is Hiromatsu just actually protesting what Toronaga's doing? Because pretty much everybody else at this point thinks that Toronaga's days are numbered. I think there are many layers to look at this scene, having really worked very closely with the two actors at the center of it. And the director of this, I can speak to what was played. Takuma-san, who plays Hiramatsu, had a great idea for an adjustment that we made at the last minute for this scene, which is that these three generals who are coming into this, who are wearing armor as a, as a demonstration of protest at a funeral, which is a very common historical phenomenon at that time. They're in this position where they're going to make a stand. And Takuma-san wanted to play Hiromatsu's insertion of himself as a choice that he makes to spare their lives. Because if he could speak up to his lord and die in their place, then they won't have to commit seppuku. So he does it before they can do it as really a, a humane gesture to these three men who have served him as well as Toronaga all this time. Because of that, there's a great moment in the scene between Toronaga and Hiromatsu where Toronaga turns to Hiromatsu in shock because he did not intend for Hiromatsu to do this. And I don't think Hiromatsu knew that Toronaga wanted these generals to commit seppuku, you know, in order to show his enemies that he had surrendered and truly given up and that he has no hope, right? But yeah. in order for that narrative to be perfect, his most treasured general really has to do it. And that's something that I don't think even Toronaga wanted to do. And so when you look back on it from the place of understanding what you know at the end of the episode, that all of this was performance art for Toronaga, you know, which I recommend doing is watching especially this episode a second time because there's a whole yeah, other layer yeah. that emerges. You see that this scene is truly a tragedy on a level that is more than what it even appears to be. That not only does his best friend kill himself in front of him, but he really didn't have to. Emotions run high in this episode as the characters contend with their own beginnings and endings. Death is ever-present in our story, but it's in this episode that we see the customs around it for the first time with the funeral of Nagakado. That funeral scene, it's like three minutes on camera, but it's way more involved than you would think. We're now hearing episode 8's director, Emmanuel Osei Kafour, who, like everyone involved in this show, sought to get all the historical details just right. But Emmanuel definitely had his work cut out for him in this episode. From the chants that the lead monk was chanting to the people that are involved in the procession, the order of people is very particular and necessary, and it's it was painstaking. They would go through that list and would have to essentially wrangle over 80 people over the two days that we shot this work. And, you know, just saying 80 people doesn't sound that bad, but when you're doing one take of like, let's say like there's this wide shot that you get before the burning of the coffin happens where we see, you know, people coming into that tent, but there's like 40 people in front and behind these two characters. And every, if anything went wrong in a take, 
we would have to reset 80 people, which meant everybody had to go back. And, you know, we had a horse involved in that. We had <laughs> this confetti that was being thrown. We had all this stuff happening and it was a small, I mean, we had a big lot, but it was, it was just a lot. So by the end of this episode, Tornaga has lost both his son and his right-hand man, his best friend, back to back. Mm -hmm. So how do you think he's feeling coming out of all of this? We were starting to see the fullness of his plan, but where do you think Tornaga is at emotionally right now? I think he's lost everything. I, I think he's lost everything, but I also think that that just makes his resoluteness, his plan moving forward, that much more important. And sonata -san helped us out at the very end of the episode. He proposed having Tornaga say, thank you for your sacrifice, Nagakato, my son. Thank you. Thank you, Hiramatsu. You've given me more time. That wasn't mm -hmm. in the script originally. It was just supposed to be this quiet moment. But I think it's reflective of just how much these two people meant to him. And there's no turning back now. He's now fully committed to Crimson Sky. You know, he's committed to taking down Osaka. He's, he's now committed. But you know, I think it's very, very interesting because and it was fun to shoot that moment before he gets to the gravesite because before he, like when he wakes up in bed, I um, mean, he has this moment before he opens the door and goes to the gravesite. I really wanted to have another moment where it's his first day after the loss of his best friend. Yeah. And it's, a, I think, in that moment before he opens the door, I think it's the first true moment of vulnerability that he has. Yeah. Um, it's the first real emotion we see in an episode where everything is more calculated. Another really, you know, I, I imagine as a director, an interesting challenge in this episode is the tea ceremony, which is such an important moment for Buntaro and Mariko. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that scene and, and how you approached it? Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes. Justin, at the very beginning of production, he made it clear that he really wanted this moment to feel symbolic and emotional. He said he wanted it to feel like a little bit like chef's table in the way that they really <laughs> imbue every shot with this emotion and this intentionality with all these extreme close-ups. And there's this poetic nature to a lot of those the scenes in that show. And Buntaro, he's not just a highly accomplished samurai, he's also a tea ceremony expert. And there's a backstory that we never really touch on, but he had done this for Mariko before. This wasn't the first time he did it, which is quite an interesting dichotomy for that character. But I think for this scene, it was his attempt to reset their relationship. There was a lot of conversations about just where we could insert emotion without destroying the integrity of that ceremony and making it feel as accurate as possible. But for them, you know, it's kind of this attempt, this sort of olive branch between them. It's them kind of making the movements toward maybe repairing their relationship, but then it ends with this really powerful declaration from Mariko. And after this point, it really feels like she's made a decision about her marriage and really who she wants to be going forward. So how did you and Anna kind of work that out in this scene? It was a challenging, challenging scene because even when Buntaro invites her to the tea ceremony, you see this intense resentment towards Buntaro. And so coming into this one of the things that I did talk to Anna about was those moments when she's in the room alone before Buntaro comes in are quite key in setting up her internal state. There's this moment where she realizes that, you know, the level of thought that he's put into like the words that are on that wall scroll, the choice of that plant with a, with a drop of water on it. It all takes her back to moments where Buntaro wasn't as abusive, but it also acknowledges just where her frame of mind is and the very, very same things that she's worried about. Like the whole poem that she starts to recite when Buntaro first comes in begins to neutralize her hatred for Buntaro and allows her to take in the ceremony. When Buntaro actually starts to conduct the ceremony, I think even she's surprised by just how it's allowing her in that moment just like the precision and the magic of the tea ceremonies, allowing her to see her husband differently, even just for a moment. It's not that she likes her husband again. It's not that she is remembering their love. It's not about that at all, but it's almost they're acknowledging their fate and they've forgotten their anger towards each other. And they're just kind of resting in the sadness of what the future is. As Mariko enters the tea house, 
She and Buntaro are both desperately in need of a timeout and the kind of intimacy that can be found in the formality of a tea ceremony. The tea house is a world into itself where she and her husband can exist without judgment outside their daily lives. In episode eight, we see the tea ceremony presented from a husband to a wife, but the ceremony has been used in many different contexts over the years. In the Sengoku era, the ceremony would be performed by warlords and their generals as a test of intimacy and trust for their guests. Guests would lay down their weapons, entering the tea house unarmed. At that very moment, all people would become equal. Rank, class, it all fell away. In a way, the ceremony began before anyone even set foot in the room. As they approached the tea house, guests would take the time to consider their surroundings, no detail being too small to be observed and appreciated, from the small garden outside the structure to the sounds of nature that surrounded the space. The interior of the tea house was constructed with exposed, natural wood, allowing the calm of the garden to fill the house. A carefully chosen scroll, called a kakejiku, would hang on the wall. Every bit of decoration was chosen with the guests in mind. Every element mattered, from the brush strokes of the calligraphy on the scroll to the drop of dew on a flower petal, as we saw in Buntaro's ceremony. The ritual itself would begin with the host carefully washing each utensil in front of the guests until not a speck of dust was seen. Preparation of the tea was an exercise in balance and grace, and every movement of the host during the serving of the tea was to be appreciated. The cups were picked out specifically for the ceremony, leaving behind the everyday dishware to display the tastes of the host. It wouldn't be until after the serving of the tea, when trust had been established between allies and friends, that informal conversation could start up again. Near the end of the Sengoku period, the ceremony was elevated by an innovative tea master named Sen no Rikyu. Hosokawa Tadaoki, Lady Gracia's husband and the real-life inspiration for Buntaro, was one of this tea master's most accomplished students. The Japanese tea ceremony was, and is to this day, a setting where every detail matters. So naturally, every detail mattered to our research team as well, both in this scene and another pivotal moment in episode eight. The art department has done an enormous effort to recreate the funeral as as accurate as possible. Returning to the show is historian Frederick Krenz, here to tell us a bit more about the customs surrounding a high-ranking samurai's funeral. So it's after the body is washed, it is put into a coffin, and that coffin is put into a palanquin. And then the palanquin is brought in a procession outside of the city, mostly in in the mountains, where there is a cremation site. The palanquin would Mm -hmm. go a few times around the site before being put on the pit. And then you have the monks, because it's a Buddhist funeral. And a Buddhist funeral is a cremation because the Buddha himself was cremated. This episode also in the middle of all of this is our first introduction of Edo, which is, you know, the city that will become Tokyo. How long had Edo been around at this point? Like, was it started by Tokugawa Ieyasu or did it have a kind of previous life as a, a smaller village? Yes, it had a long history already as a small castle. But at the time when Iyasu got into Edo, there was almost nothing left, I think. It was really a a small Mm. village and and an old uh, castle in in ruins, to say so. So he started to build it from scratch. It was conveniently located because on the roads you had uh, the river, the Sumida River, you had the sea. So it, it was at crossroads. And I think that Iyasa envisaged that it would become the new capital of Japan in the future. So in Edo, we see Blackthorn finally, after a very long time, get to reunite with his crew. I was wondering if you knew what happened to William Adams's crew in real life. Did they survive? Did any of them stay in Japan? Yes, more than 10 survived. And so they all settled in Japan. Most of them, I think, married Japanese, got children. We know from the documents at the time that, for example, one Dutchman married the daughter of the master of an inn. You have one who settled in Sakai, which was a merchant city south of Osaka. He became a trader. 
So uh, they, they all have their own stories, but they really settled in Japan and, and married Japanese and probably all learned Japanese and spoke it fluently, I think. So we hear some of Mariko's skill for poetry this week in the tea ceremony scene, of course, and then also at the very end of the episode. And I understand that you wrote the Japanese versions of the poems that we hear in the show. So how did you go about capturing this style of poetry? Yes, I did. So I first studied hundreds of, of poems from the time yeah. to be able to compose something that would be acceptable for the samurai. It was the linked verse, which is called Renga in uh, Japanese. Yeah. Linked first poetry was enormously popular among the world yeah. notes. Because if you're not good at poetry, you're not accepted right. as a samurai. <laughs> this is something people in the West and, and even in, in modern Japan don't understand yeah. completely. You also had a lot of classical references and the people who responded to the, the first poem had to have knowledge right. of that. Otherwise, he would be seen as a barbarian. <laughs> so you had to have a lot of knowledge, wisdom and skill and also ability to quickly grasp the situation and communicate with the mm. others. Nobody appreciates Mariko's way with words quite as much as Toronaga. And just as she carefully constructed her verses, Tokugawa Ieyasu meticulously planned the city of Edo from the ground up. But it's hard to believe the swampy fishing town we see in this episode will someday be the sprawling metropolis of Tokyo. The biggest thing for us was to convey a city that's being built. Back to talk us through capturing the beginnings of the most populous city in the world is production designer Helen Jarvis. First thing was to understand what state the city would have been in in 1600. It wasn't as large. It was very much in development. It had existed before our, our Toronaga character comes. So there was some form of a manor house or some very low-lying building when he would have first taken over, and it was not suitable. So he then set about building. So much of Osaka is aged and you know, weathered and has long established. But to try to convey so many things about Edo that it was not, the castle would not have been decorative. So early on, mm -hmm. we decided to keep everything into wood tones. We had wooden floors. We didn't have tatami mats. All the mm. decorative screens, we didn't have any for Edo. They were all different types of woodwork, wooden screens, to create a very different feel to the interiors. And also in terms of the, the gardens and vegetation, we decided that we were going to keep everything less manicured, you know, more in the state of flux. Right. And there were people building and using tools and such and uh, scaffolding around buildings. So again, we were just trying to paint this very different, very new place that was yeah. being built. I was wondering, because now, you know, we've seen Osaka, we've seen Edo, and of course, Ajiro. These are kind of our, you know, our main settings here, yes. and they all have their different profiles, oh, as yeah. we've been talking about. I was wondering, just from the angle of color, though, if there was any thought into kind of how the palettes of all these different places. Yeah. You touched on Ajiro. We mm -hmm. actually had two slightly different parts of Ajiro. We decided early on that we needed a beautiful bay. We found mm -hmm. a, a great location some distance outside Vancouver. Again, in conversation with Frederick, he pointed out a few films that had been made that were fairly authentic. And we looked at these houses and they were very weathered and grey. So that seemed to suit the waterfront existence. And then the upper part of the village, we had a different location, and it was in a wooded area, as if this is where the more well-to-do or the samurai class would live up there. Those sets had much more of a richer wood tone. So we went quite grey and weathered for the lower part of the town, and very much richer with thatched roofing and so sort of deeper, richer wood tones. Again, being conscious that you've got episodes rolling one into the next and that it's right. important to differentiate where you are. So I wanted to talk about a scene in episode eight that I'm sure was a huge feat from the production design point of view, which is the tea ceremony. It's funny you say that because it's actually one of those things that was relatively easy to construct mm. because there are tea houses still in existence. So there was a lot of information about the tea house and it's so specific you're not going to deviate 
you could take a little license with some sets, but the tea house had to be exactly a certain measurement, it had to have exactly a certain layout, and the action is incredible incredibly choreographed and we mm -hmm. had a lovely lady who came and throughout and was our mistress of the tea ceremony every step of the way was carefully carefully vetted so in an odd sort of way it was quite easy because it was all there <laughs> <laughs> it was there to be yeah. discovered you know it was there for us to follow examples and certainly paintings and, and actual drawings and with dimensions of tea houses so were most of the kind of elements of it more curated by the tea house expert? Yes and no. I mean, there were some oddities. There were these double-sided shoji that were you know, paper on both sides. They had these strange little hmm. depressed handles, unlike any other shoji. Also, the use of rice paper around the base of the walls. There had to be certain hmm. areas had plain cream, you know, off-white rice paper, and certain areas had a bluish gray blue paper and also the ceremony itself is so extraordinary i'm curious what the most interesting aspect was for you uh designing the sets for the show it may have been in the gardens our interior sets were all on stage but so right. much of the interiors were reliant on the exterior on seeing outside so if you're just looking through a portal into a beautiful garden, that's one thing. But when you take characters out into the garden and you play a scene in the garden, the garden needs to be really good and it needs to be quite realistic. And it's also about how it's lit, you know, to make it really feel as if you're outdoors. And the garden in Blackthorne's house, that's outdoors as well, yeah. That was an interesting location. It, it, it was just a little car park, if you can believe that. A car park right. in between two sort of slightly hilly, you know, a little bit of a valley, if you will. And again, we looked at that and thought, well, there's a good location. There's something we can actually yeah. build houses up the hillside a little bit, create a little bit more of a dynamic to it. Yeah, that garden, that was a lot of fun doing the exterior gardens on location. Mm -hmm. A lot of it came down to seasonally what could we plant and mm. how much of the garden was actually real and how much of it was artificial. And also the protocols of how you arrange stones, how you arrange pathways. Fascinating stuff. That's all for this week's episode of Shogun, the official podcast. Next week, what secret mission has Torinaga sent Mariko to carry out in Osaka? Where do Yabushige's loyalties really lie, and how will he and Blackthorn try to escape their destinies? Tune in next week when we discuss the penultimate episode of Shogun. You can find a link in our description to episodes 1 through 8 of Shogun. And if you want to dive deeper into the world of our story, check out the official Shogun Viewer's Guide. There's a link to that in the show notes as well. Be sure to rate, review, and follow Shogun, the official podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Emily Yoshida, and I'll see you next week.